Hello everyone. Today we're taking some of the first steps into programming cheap old school EEPROMs like this Winbond W27C512, essentially building an EEPROM programmer completely from scratch. You might have noticed that it's possible to program some of the modern ROMs with nothing more than an Arduino of some sort and maybe a register to hold some address bits. That's possible because modern ROMs are 5 or even 3 volt programmable and at some point I built this prototype shield that can program flash ROMs. But for older ROMs, like this one and the UV erasable kind with the little window for that matter, you typically need 12 volts to program it and for this one specifically, since it's technically electrically erasable, you also need a 14 volt source to erase it. If you have a TL866 style programmer, that's great, since it'll supply all the voltages needed to program basically anything. But if you don't have one, that's kind of a bummer, since a programmer like that will set you back at least 60, 70 bucks on Amazon. Which is kind of crazy if you just want to reprogram the single $2 ROM you bought for the 65 Arduino kit I gave away in my last video. Speaking of, so many thanks for the amazing reception that got, especially to everyone who bought one after I couldn't give any more away for free. I have some more news about the 65 Arduino kits later in the video. But let's say we want to erase and reprogram this ROM on a more limited budget than buying a commercial programmer. What do we do? Well, if we take a look at the datasheet for this particular model, we'll find a waveform diagram that shows the bit twiddling we need to do. It's mostly just good practice and not strictly necessary, but first we read the serial number by setting A9 to 12 volts, and otherwise doing a normal read of the manufacturer ID, and then reading the device ID by setting A0 to 5 volts. And if you don't read the right IDs, we probably have to chip in backwards and want to stop putting 12 volts on the line immediately. But where things get a bit more complicated is the next step, where we need to up the voltage on A9 to 14 volts and also put 14 volts on the programming voltage pin, which is normally the output enable pin. Let's worry about the control signals, data, and how to change the programming voltage from 14 to 12 volts later. If we assume we have some sort of computer or microcontroller available that can supply the normal 5 volt signals, we're still missing something that'll supply the higher voltage. Luckily, we have these tiny little switching boost converters that'll probably do the job just fine. So let's put it on a breadboard and see if we can get that working. But as you might have noticed, it's not going to fit on a breadboard, so I have a little breakout PCB we can use. It's not the right footprint, but I can probably make it fit anyway. The chip we have here is a MIC-2288, originally made by Micrel, now acquired by Microchip. So while I try and fail, to solder this right onto the camera, let's see what we need to do to get it to output the 14 volts from the datasheet. Since it's a switching boost regulator and not a linear regulator, we need a few more external components besides the chip itself. Technically, all the regulator does is to pulse width modulate a MOSFET inside the IC, which is connected to the switch pin and either charges or floats the external inductor at a frequency of 1.2 MHz at a variable duty cycle. When the switch is closed, the inductor charges, storing energy in its magnetic field, and when the switch is opened, the inductor resists the change in current and releases its stored energy through the diode and charges the output capacitor, which then smooths out the output voltage. Since we want a specific voltage, we can control it by putting a voltage divider on the feedback pin that drops our desired voltage down to the reference voltage of 1.24 volts for this regulator. The feedback voltage is then used to increase the duty cycle of the MOSFET if it's under the reference and decrease the duty cycle if it's over the reference. And that's how a switching boost converter works. It looks like I didn't short anything I didn't intend to, and we're ready to stick this in the breadboard. Actually, putting a switching regulator like this on a breadboard might not be such a good idea, even on a good breadboard, since it doesn't take much to make it unstable. It really needs rock-solid connections capable of handling the max current, and if for some reason the feedback pin is grounded, Whatever is connected will almost instantly receive the max voltage the regulator can deliver, which is well over 30 volts. The best 10 microhenry inductor I have also doesn't come in a breadboard friendly package, but it's pretty easy to solder to pin headers, so I'll just do that. Maybe I could just solder it across the regulator pins right on the breakout, but let's see if we can't make this work first. 
Next, we need a diode, and the datasheet recommends a shot key for efficiency reasons, and I have a mystery bag where I've penned in 1 amp 20 volts. And my multimeter seems to agree, so I guess that'll do, and I can stick with the theme of putting SMD parts on a breadboard. I might have a through hole 1N 5819 somewhere, which might actually be a better fit, but where's the fun in that when we get to melt some metal doing it this way? It's not a huge part, but what I usually do in these cases is to make sure the easiest to solder part is reasonably tinned, and then use that to tack down one side of the not-so-handy component. That makes it pretty easy to solder the other side correctly, and if the tacked side looks like a cold joint, I can redo that afterwards. I'm pretty sure this is fine though. Before I start putting wires in, I'll rearrange these parts slightly so they're closer to the regulator. First I connect the power rails and put a 10 microfarad input cap on the rail. Then I connect the inductor to the diode and put another 10 microfarad capacitor on the output. The next thing we need is the voltage divider and I just happen to have a 47,000 and 4700 ohm resistor here. The math says that should give us an output voltage of 13.64 volts, but the regulator datasheet also seems to hint it might overshoot at light loads. So let's see where we're at first. The 4700 ohm resistor seemed a bit loose, so I connected it to the ground pin instead of the rail. We also need to connect the enable pin high, but instead of connecting it straight to the 5 volt rail, I like to put a little RC delay on it to let the input cap charge and things settle. I put 2200 ohms and a 100 nanofarad capacitor, which means it'll go active about 0.1 milliseconds after power comes on. Probably unnecessary. I don't want to turn it on with no load at all, so I put an LED with a 2200 ohm resistor on the output. At 14 volts, that should be around 6 milliamps. Later, I'll probably use the 65 Arduino to actually program our ROM, technically making it self replicating. But for now, I'll just use it as a convenient USB breakout board. Let's see what happens if I plug it in. The LED stays off. That's not great. Oh, that makes sense. I don't have the other ground rail connected. Let's see if that doesn't help. Oh, that looks better. The LED is on. Yay. Let's see what the multimeter says. Maybe I celebrated a bit too soon. Six volts might be higher than the five that came in, but it's not what we're going for. Let's see if cleaning up the breadboard a bit doesn't improve things. The connection wire from the inductor to the diode is a bit long. The input cap should probably be closer to the power pin and the inductor. And I guess an extra power line can't hurt to make sure it's not a loose connection. Okay, the light is back on. And we're reading a higher voltage, but not quite the 13, 14 volts we should. But it's rising, so maybe I'm adding some capacitance here. Let's try moving the output cap to the other rail. Maybe there's a loose connection to ground. Even better, 13 volts, but not quite there. It could be the voltage divider, so let's see what happens if we add 2200 ohms to the top of it. That should increase the voltage slightly. Oh. 14.25 volts, now we're actually a bit over. Let's try something smaller, like a thousand ohms extra on top. 14.3, that's even higher. Let's just see if it wasn't just a loose connection to begin with and put a jumper in there. So I played around with it for a while, and I just realized the feedback is connected to the inductor instead of the diode output. I guess the 14 plus volts we were seeing was just the maximum the circuit could randomly handle. Whoops. With that in mind, I better clean up the circuit a bit before I increase the load to see what it can handle. Maybe I will have to solder the inductor and input capacitor to the breakout eventually, but I hope this will be stable enough until I'm ready to put it all on a PCB. Okay, now we have 6 volts out. I'm pretty sure I have the right resistors in there, but I better check to make sure. 
They look fine, but I have a hunch the USB power supply might need a bit of help. The 65 Arduino itself is pretty power hungry to begin with, compared to a microcontroller at least, so maybe it's drawing a bit much current. I'll put a 220 microfarad on the rail and hopefully I'm right and that'll help. And it looks like I am. But I also forgot to plug in the top feedback resistor, so I guess our new max is 15.4 volts. Better get the resistor back in there before we fry the regulator. But if we put it back, we get 13.74 volts, which is only 0.1 volts above the goal. Less than 1% off, that's actually pretty good. If we add another 1k, that should get us very close to 14 volts. There it is, the 14 volts we need to erase an EEPROM. I guess we can confirm the input capacitance was the problem by removing the cap. Yeah, that dropped it back down to 6 volts, so I guess that's some sort of proof. I guess maybe we learned that building a boost regulator on a breadboard is a bad idea. Or maybe that it needs some special attention if we do. I hope you appreciate seeing the mistakes I make along the way. I could have left them out, but I think those are the parts that you just don't get from a datasheet. So now we have the 14 volts erasure voltage we need, but of course we can't get away with just a high voltage. In that case, we could have just used an op amp. We also need a bit of current to actually burn the ROM. I keep messing around with it for a while, adding and removing caps and playing with the beefier resistors to see how much current the circuit can handle before the voltage starts to drop. And it looks like it can only supply about 25 milliamps at 14 volts before it starts to drop. That's under the 30 milliamp max current listed in the datasheet for the ROM, but I have a feeling we can get away with it. And if we can't, we can probably make the regulator a bit happier by adding capacitance or making the circuit tighter. Of course, we also need some way to turn the high voltage on and off, and of course the 65 Arduino can't handle 14 volts, but I'm pretty sure I have a way. You might have guessed that I'll eventually make this into a PCB shield for the 65 Arduino, and by extension a shield for many other development boards. In the next video in this series, I hope to get as far as erasing one of these EEPROMs and eventually get to programming it with the 65 Arduino. And again, speaking of the 65 Arduino, the first 25 boards I gave away in the last video disappeared in a few hours, and the next 10 I added were also gone before I had a chance to look around. I would have loved to give away more, but with the time it takes for packing, shipping, and bookkeeping, that's about what I could handle. I don't have anyone to do that, so it's all me. I'm sorry to say I can't offer to send anything to the UK after all, since that means I'll have to sign up for UK VAT and deal with His Majesty's Revenue and Customs on a regular basis. And that is a bit more than I can handle at the moment. Hopefully I'll find a way around that in the future, maybe a middleman company, but for now Brexit has made the UK off limits. Thanks to the friendly people from the UK that did order for understanding. Meanwhile, I'm happy to say 65 Arduino boards have arrived successfully all over Europe, in Australia, Canada and the US, and I'm super happy I could make that happen and absolutely worth the trouble. I still have a few kits left to sell and hopefully I'll be stocked up on ROMs, 6507 CPUs and 6532 Riots next week. I'll put a link in the description for that. If you'd like to stay up to date, get help with the kit or other old electronics, you're super welcome in the clubhouse on Discord. I'd love to see what you make too. Either way, thanks for watching.